Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second panel of today's events on how the Iraq War ended. To begin with some brief introductions, we have Ambassador Mohammed Ali Akim, who is Undersecretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Western Africa. Dr. Al Hakim has held several senior government positions in Iraq, including Foreign Minister of Iraq between 2018 to 2020, Minister of Telecommunications, Acting Minister of Finance, as well as Deputy Secretary General of the Iraqi Governing Council. We also have Ambassador James F. Jeffrey, who is the chair of the Wilson Center's Middle East program and is a Slater Family Distinguished Fellow. Ambassador Jeffrey served as U.S. Ambassador to Iraq between 2010 and 2012 and to Turkey between 2008 and 2010. He also served as the Secretary's Special Representative for the Syria Engagement and the Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS from 2018 to 2020. He's a senior American diplomat with experience in political, security, and energy issues in the Middle East, Turkey, Germany, as well as the Balkans. Also joining us is Lieutenant Colonel Ben Ferguson, who is a professor of military science in BU's Division of Military Education. Lieutenant Colonel Ferguson served two tours in Iraq, the first between 2004 and 2005, as well as 2008 to 2010, where he was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor and the Purple Heart. He most recently served as a battalion commander for the 3rd Battalion, 81st Armored Regiment at Fort Benning, Georgia. Our panel's moderator is Shamirin Mako, who is Assistant Professor of International Relations at the Party School of Global Studies. She's the author of After the Uprisings, Progress and Stagnation in the Middle East and North Africa. Professor Mako's areas of expertise include Middle East politics, foreign intervention, ethnic conflict, political violence, and post-conflict state and peace building, as well as drawing on her own experience of Iraqi heritage. Thank you all very much, and thank you very much to the panelists. All right, good morning, everyone. I think the way we'll go about the panel is we'll have Ambassador Al-Hakim uh, speak first and cover his extensive experience, both in the Iraqi government, but also in Iraq's foreign service. And then we'll have Ambassador uh, Joffreys speak to the American experience in Iraq based on his uh, extensive knowledge of the country as well. And then we'll end it with Lieutenant Colonel Ferguson, who will touch on the Iraq war from the military perspective. And so, Ambassador Al-Hakim, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here with you uh, this morning. And uh, this is an important conference for us as Iraqis as well as for the Americans and the coalition. So uh, I, will be, I will be speaking about uh, the experience that we had in Iraq since the decision was made in the White House to remove uh, Saddam Hussein's and his government uh, from Iraq and then established a new uh, regime system in Iraq. And this is really very important steps for us. Today is 29th of March, 20th of March, of 2003, General Garner moved in from Kuwait with his arm, army into Basra, then moved up north into Nasiriya, and from Nasiriya went into Baghdad. I'll stop at Nasiriya. Nasiriya was really an important step for General Gardner because the first conference for Iraqis and the coalition happened in Nasiriya. 100 people got invited to think what are they going to do once they are in Baghdad. Once there is a regime change in Baghdad, what are the steps? What is Iraq will look like, at least in the future? Let's look at how the Iraqis and the coalition think about where this, the next step is going to be. By the time General Gardner moved in uh, to uh, Iraq on the 9th of April, the regime failed, the Republican Guard left the palace, and the American went into Baghdad peacefully, and it was very smooth uh, transition going there. April is actually was uh, uh, really a quiet month. I was in April in Baghdad of 2003. People were unsure what's happening. Saddam disappeared, the Republican Guard then gone, and uh, there is really no regime but uh, uh, the American troops. And there are a lot of a contingency of Iraqi army as well as local police, traffic police they were in Baghdad. But people, they don't know what's happening. What are the next step? 
what is the, the next uh, 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 situation in Iraq will look like. By the 28th of April, that's why I said April was quiet in, in, in Iraq. 28th of April was also a milestone for Iraqis. It was the conference of Baghdad. Baghdad conference that would gather all of the Iraqis from all type of sects. Kurds, Arabs, Turkmen, Shiites, Sunnis, all of them. They gathered in, uh, in Baghdad of what the conference is called Baghdad Conference. That conference took the output of Nasriya Conference and then it started from that point. I thought that conference was very important for us. General Gardner actually listened uh, very carefully to what the Iraqis want to see going forward. Two personalities were attended uh, that conference. One of them is Ambassador Zalmay Khalid Zad. Jim Jeffrey knows uh, Zalmay very well. And the second one, Ambassador uh, Frank Richard Dooney. And also they dealt with Iraq very well. They know the Iraqis. They've dealt with Iraq's uh, opposition leaders for a long period of time. That conference actually resulted, even though it was a lot of different opinion, a lot of different uh, 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 class of, of uh, representations, but the result of that conference was very important. General Gardner summarized that conference at the end. He said, okay, I will give Iraqis between six to eight weeks to come out with a plan of a transitional government that led by Iraqis, and we will be, as a coalition army, will be side by side with them, will help them move forward. That was very positive at that time. But May came, the May of 2003, things has changed. The White House, the White House has appointed Ambassador Paul Brimmer to come in and become the sole administrator, civil administrator of Iraq. And I don't know what happened at the White House. Why did they change their mind of the output of Baghdad conference? And they came in and appointed Paul Brimmer. Paul Bremer is, 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 a, is a person that actually, his experience is in Europe, Northern Europe. He served in, in the Netherlands. He served in the Nordic. He was uh, in the anti-terrorism uh, 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 section in the, in the foreign uh, uh, service. So he doesn't know the Middle East well. He doesn't know Iraq for sure well. He, he hasn't been to the Middle East. So the question is why the White House actually decided to go with Paul Bremer as the sole administrator or civil administration. Paul Bremer came in and the first order, and Paul Bremer met with the Iraqis. And he said to them, I am the decision maker. I am the sole governor of Iraq now. You have to report to me. Now that's a different atmosphere, different change of the Iraqi atmosphere. So the Iraqis were shocked. They said, well, with Garner, Garner, by the way, knew Iraq very well. He studied Iraq. His wife is an Iraqi Kurd. He knows Iraq very well. He waited in Kuwait for a long time, What with a lot of Iraqis, was in Nasiriyah conference, was in Baghdad conference. So Garner comes from a background different from Paul Bremer's. Paul Bremer's background is completely different. So now Paul Bremer is actually the sole administrator, civil administrator of Iraq, and he asked all the Iraqis to come and actually, you know, uh, work with him. Now that's a big change. The first order that Paul Bremer has done was a disaster, is a debathification. He has removed all of the four layers of the Ba'athist from all of the institutions and government in Iraq. Somebody says, yeah, when Ba'athist has to go, but they governed Iraq for 35 years. They actually ran the ministries. They ran the institutions. They were professors. They were medical doctors. They were chief of engineers. They were everywhere. If you remove the first top four layers, then who is going to be the civil servants in Iraq? Who's going to run the state at that time? So that was decision one in the first week or the second week uh, of May. The second order, which was even worse than the first order, is he, resolved, he dissolved the, the, the army, the Iraqi army. 
Now, the Iraqi army is a million people. It's not, they are not all Ba'athists. There is the Republican Guards. They are uh, 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 an elite group. They were actually uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, were, they were close to Saddam in his palace and so on. And they were the elite group. But the whole army is just that's a dangerous thing happened in Iraq. All, all the officers and so on. Now, let me, give, let me give you a landscape of what Iraq looks like. Iraq has six neighbors, Iran, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, okay? None of them, none of these countries were part of the coalition. None of them was part of the coalition, okay? So some of these countries are not happy with the American troops coming to Baghdad removing the regime, okay? Now, if you remove all of the army, there are four divisions that actually secure the border. We have border with these six countries about 4,000 kilometers. Who is gonna secure the border? Now you left Iraq naked, completely naked. There is absolutely nobody at the borders coming in. So what the Syrian said, the Syrian took all of the people in prison and he said, okay, Go to Iraq, all right? Everybody actually go to Iraq. We don't want to see you in Iraq anymore, and uh, in, in, in Syria anymore. So the situation was really dangerous. These two decision, and Paul Bremer didn't have to do them at all. He needs just to relax, you know, take his time. The coalition is already won. They've already accomplished their goals. But why do you have to do these two big orders in sequence. One of them is to remove the civil uh, uh, sort of administrator of Iraqi uh, states. The second is to remove the entire army completely. Now, to make th the things worse, the third de de decision that was even worse than the, the, the first two. The, uh, the, the US were under the pressure from Russia, President Putin, and from the French, President Chirac, because the US and Britain did not have the authority from the Security Council to go into Iraq. They were not authorized. They didn't have any authority from the Security Council. So Jack Chirac and Putin pressured the White House, and they said, you have to go to the Security Council and get permission. So what the U.S. has done, and that's really, and Jim Jeffrey could actually tell me about that, I don't understand the logic behind the U.S. And the U.S., by the way, was the pen holder in the Security Council of Iraq. Nobody could write a resolution for Iraq, okay, but the U.S. The U.S., the pen holder for Iraq. So what happened? The U.S. And the, and the coalition and, and the U.K., under the pressure from the French and, and the Russian, they go and put resolution under Chapter 7, uh, 1,483. That is a resolution that was the most dangerous resolution where they identified their troops are an occupied uh, uh, army. An occupied army is, is just a dangerous situation. Now the Arab and the Muslims in an Islamic world, when, when you have an occupied forces, that means these are the forces that are by force uh, occupying a country. Now you are eligible to do a jihad against them, okay? All of the Muslims have, this is a foreign forces occupied a Muslim country, therefore it is a qualified for a jihad against that army. This is a very dangerous situation. So now what happened, most of the organization, most of uh, 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 brotherhood, Islam brotherhoods and all of that, they said let's you know, uh, gather together from Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, all of them. They all gathered and they formed an army to fight the occupied army. The occupied army is the U.S. Army. Three decisions in May, they were the hardest decisions being made against the Iraqis. So 
when the conference says the war end, actually Garner has ended the war, succeeded in removing uh, Saddam's and his regime. Uh, on the 9th of April, the war for Iraqis started in late of May. Why? Because these three decisions affected Iraq tremendously. And from the 2003 and forward, it was really uh, um, just a matter of fighting terrorists everywhere. There is, the, the, they organized extremely well. You get a lot of people <coughs> who have left uh, uh, the Ba'ath Party regime. They left the army officers with their weapons and uh, they have nothing to do. There's no directions. When Paul Bremer told them, go home, what do they do at home? There is nothing left for them, okay? The top officers, there is nothing left for them there. So therefore, it is, uh, you know, after that 1483, the decision was very easy for the Islamic Brotherhood and for everybody else to say, let's gather our forces and fight uh, uh, the occupied uh, uh, army, which is the U.S. Army. That's where the casualties happened. That's where a lot of Iraqi casualties, a lot of, a lot of U.S. casualties happen. And then also for the Iraqis, for the Iraqis, they have to sort of go forward with a transitional government. Kofi Annan was the U.N. Secretary General, has uh, appointed Sergio de Mello. He's a Brazilian diplomat. And Sergio de Mello has a brain. And he sat with the Brimmer. And he said to him, look, this is not going to work. You need to have an Iraqi group that govern Iraq. And you have to put an Iraqi group. And therefore, uh, uh, the birth of the governing council came in of the 25 Iraqis has a, a step from all sects. They came in and actually start. They have legislative as well as executive power where they actually uh, worked uh, through the process and worked with Paul Bremer uh, through that. It's been really a tough two months for us. The best month was the April of 2003. The worst month was May 2003. And then going forward was the consequences of decisions that were made. They were not very uh, well organized decisions. Uh, and, and this is what uh, we suffered going forward uh, with, with ISIS and then Daesh and then Al-Qaeda. Then Pre President George Bush, of course, 2006, uh, uh, made what's called the surge. Probably Jim Jeffrey will talk to you about the surge. The surge actually has brought in 20,000 more troops, and they went in after the Al-Qaeda and Zarqawi, and they actually uh, uh, destroyed them, uh, but with a lot of cost, and the cost was tremendous. So <laughs> let me talk a little bit very quickly, if you allow me, on, on a couple of things. Iraq was a bankrupt state. In 2003, we had zero currency at, this, and, and at the central bank. We only have, had five tons of gold that's been actually lowered down into the Tigris River. They put them in a container, put them in Tigris River, and then we actually confiscated those. Now, Iraq had a GDP at that time of $810 per person per annum. They were just way down uh, on, 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 on the scales of, of the economic uh, scales. Iraqi was in debt to Kuwait, $56 billion from the invasion of Kuwait. They were in debt to Paris Club, which is the ninth, uh, the 19th <coughs> countries that lend Iraq, $132 billion. They were in debt to 65 countries. They were in debt to, to a lot of uh, uh, companies. And so Iraq was bankrupt uh, in 2003, practically fully in debt. Today, after 20 years, after ISIS, and thanks also to the coalition, the US and, and the coalition to destroy ISIS, Iraq today is recovered. Iraq has an army that, uh, that is well-trained uh, to uh, fight terrorism, and it also uh, recovered economically from a zero reserved in the central bank. The central bank of Iraq today has $115 billion. We paid all of our debts completely, and we, we cleaned up 
that to Kuwait, that to all of the Paris Club, that to everyone. And today, Iraq uh, uh, GDP per, per annum, per person, per annum, is 6,900 from 810. Iraq today has a reserve of 130 tons of gold from five tons. So there is a recovery in the economic side. There is a little bit of a uh, uh, push toward uh, to uh, build Iraq uh, completely. For those people, and I'm done, I know that you want me to finish. Uh, for those people who think Iraq is a failed country, I'll tell you one thing. I just came back from Iraq. Iraq is actually flourishing. It has a good relationship with its neighbors. It becomes really uh, a country, Baghdad in particular, become uh, a place where countries could actually come and uh, uh, resolve their issues. An example of Saudi Arabia and Iran, the, 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 the negotiations were very clear in Iraq. And then also there is the Baghdad conference where there are a lot of people from the Arab world uh, came in uh, to that uh, conference. Baghdad today is different from Baghdad 2003, different from Baghdad 2006, and different from Baghdad of uh, 2017, where we have defeated uh, ISIS. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador Jeffrey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marco. It's uh, really great to be here. Thanks to you for inviting me. It's particularly good to be here with my uh, colleague and friend, uh, Ambassador and Minister Al-Hakim, and a uh, fellow admirer <coughs> of General Corelli in uh, Baghdad 2004. Uh, and uh, uh, two preliminary remarks. First of all, I agree with you that uh, Iraq is a success. Uh, people don't understand that. It's more thanks to the Iraqis, frankly, than uh, in what they brought to the whole struggle uh, than to uh, wisdom on America's part, but I'll get to pluses and minuses on that in a second. I'm not quite as optimistic because I am concerned about Iran's role. But uh, uh, to put it even more bluntly than the ambassador did it, and more crudely, uh, it's pumping almost half as much oil every day as Saudi Arabia. And without that oil, friends, we wouldn't have a coalition to stop Russia in Ukraine. It's that simple. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, kind of to quote Apocalypse Now, smells like victory. Uh, I'll come back to Vietnam in a second because I'm going to be all over the place. Uh, I'm a practitioner, not a uh, student of war. I'm not a practitioner of war. I'm a practitioner of diplomacy in conflicts, uh, not a uh, student of war and conflict. Uh, and so I'm in the shadow of the great presentations this morning. But I am uh, also a uh, Germanist, and any Germanist tends to be a fan of Clausewitz. And of course, you all know his uh, great um, thesis, War is a continuation of politics by other means. Uh, it's easy to say it's very hard to implement, and I've tried it at various levels, including in the White House. Uh, and we Americans have a particularly hard time doing it, and Iraq is a really great example. Uh, there's several reasons for that. One is, uh, and I was really reminded of this, of some of the historical examples we had, the Treaty of Tilsit. When's the last time you heard this? Uh, well, Westphalia, of course, is more common. But um, and the problem is we're here talking about uh, how wars end, but what do we mean by a war? Often, when we're referring to a war, we're referring to a campaign in a larger war, or, and I've been struggling this morning with how to put it, a war within a larger struggle. Arguably, 1740 to 1815 was a struggle for dominance of Europe, primarily between France and England. Arguably, 1914 to 1945, and 1914 to 1989 was a struggle for Eurasia, particularly Europe, between a cast of characters, and at the end, the United States and its allies, at least up to present, uh, emerged victorious. Uh, so it's in, the reason that this is important is we get back to, uh, Clausewitz is actually, is, uh, of Deutsch, uh, the continuation of policy by other means. Uh, what, what policy are we doing? Wars end, to summarize the question of the whole conference, when one or another side sees its policy goals advanced more by stopping a war, or fighting, 
than continuing it. But again, it gets to the question of which policies. And that's uh, complicated when you're dealing with this idea of one campaign slash war in a larger struggle or big war. Uh, example, Vietnam 1972. Uh, the policy goals that the Nixon-Kissinger team were willing to accept uh, were colored to some degree by the policy success, what got us really into Vietnam in the first place, of after 25 years, China was no longer in an aggressive posture to the rest of the region largely allied in one or another way with the United States. This gave us flexibility for different definitions of policy success sufficient to end a war. Uh, and I'll argue in a second that uh, we have the same thing with Iraq. The second uh, uh, complication with this policy is that Americans don't really get this. Uh, we had, we're too powerful and we had too many experiences where we could just tear up policy and go to war until the other side surrendered, okay? The Missouri, Appomattox, these are the kind of things that Americans are used to in wars. We win, the other side surrenders, we march into the capital, be it Mexico City, be it uh, um, uh, uh, well, we, Berlin after World War II, uh, we didn't march into Berlin after World War I, but we certainly uh, took the country down and we certainly marched into Richmond. Uh, it's harder for us to deal with these uh, policy military fits in our system. And the result is, and I'm getting close slowly to Iraq, uh, we tend to have maximalist, almost caricature policy goals, extremely ambitious, extremely advanced, infused with morality and what we think is right, not what we think is expedient, what we think is in our geopolitical, realpolitik interest, combined with inadequate actual resources, uh, skin in the game actually committed. And this leads time and time again to failure. MacArthur into North Korea in 1950. Vietnam under Johnson in Westmoreland. Uh, for years, unsuccessfully trying to get a perfect solution to Bosnia before we decided to really put in some real hard steel on target to get a very uh, soft compromise solution, and on and on again. Uh, we only do the right thing, to quote Winston Churchill, after we've done the wrong thing. And we keep repeating this, and I would argue, but we'll do that for later, we're doing this with Ukraine now. You want me to talk about Iraq? Okay, uh, an aside. The reason we did this UN resolution, it's a very good question, was, and it'll get to uh, why we got things wrong initially, uh, we needed a legal basis to stay in the country and run it under Jerry Bremer, who of course was a DOD asset. And that required the Security Council, which didn't understand the Jerry Bremer CPA, it's not in the UN Charter, but they do understand military occupations, so they blessed it under Chapter 7, so we had the right to do this. Now we changed this under pressure from the Governing Council, you remember, in Sistani, in uh, early 2004, uh, because we were planning on doing this for years, and the, we thus had to turn the country back to an Iraqi government. We went back to the UN and got a resolution saying that Iraq is now independent and sovereign. But it had a codicil that said that the United States could maintain its forces uh, not under Iraqi law, because that's always important for the U.S. military, uh, essentially a status of forces agreement given by the UN if Iraq every year applied to the UN and asked us to do this. This come, becomes relevant when I talk about how this war actually ended in 2008. Okay, uh, which is where it really ended. Um, so uh, when we're looking at Iraq, we have to say, what was the largest struggle or campaign? Because that has an impact on what our political goals were, and which war are we talking about? Uh, the larger campaign was uh, the global war on terror 
Not that Saddam had a whole lot to do with 9-11, he didn't. But various people with different points of view united in America, in a few other places, but mainly in America, in the idea that there was something fundamentally wrong with the Middle East that led to both Saddam Hussein and 9-11, and this had to be fixed. That was the campaign, to fix the Middle East so that we wouldn't have to do another 500,000 troops uh, to Kuwait, or rather to Saudi Arabia, and then send them across the berm into Kuwait in 1991, uh, and then have to come back a few years later with troops because Saddam was threatening Kuwait again. We wouldn't have to suffer another 9-11. Our goal was to fix the Middle East. That's the broader context of what we were doing in uh, Iraq. So the uh, Iraq campaign, uh, as the ambassador absolutely correctly said, first ended in 2003, a military victory. We, Tommy Franks, the commander of CENTCOM, that, and he was, he, believe me, if there's ever somebody who's explicit, it's Tommy Franks on anything, but particularly on, it's over, I'm finished, I'm going home. Uh, somebody said, you got to think about the day after. He said, no, we got to think of the day of. And I'm, 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 I'm the day of guy, I won the war. So I did my mission, that's how the war ends. And we turn it over to Ghana, who turns it over to the Iraqis. End of uh, story. Uh, but it wasn't the end of story because America had very, first of all, the place wouldn't have survived without uh, continued American presence. And that required one or another legal basis, either with a new Iraqi government or with the UN. It required one or another American civilian presence, either with Ghana or with uh, Brema. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we probably could have made better choices with uh, Ghana than we did with uh, Jerry. Not that it's Jerry's fault, but the thinking behind Jerry. But the point is, uh, we had a very ambitious goal in Iraq to transform the country as part of a belief that we had to fix the Middle East and we start with Iraq. And there were various views. There was certainly George Bush himself believed we bring democracy to the region. Uh, Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld felt, hey, we bring fear to the region. They're never going to try to whack us again because they're going to know what happens to them. Look what we're doing to Iraq. Uh, and there was never any effort to reconcile these various uh, policy goals of how to fix Iraq as a major campaign in how to fix the Middle East. I'm, I'm trying, this may sound a bit confusing, but believe me, this is how we all thought and worked. I in Iraq and um, I are working on Iraq from 04 to uh, 07 and then in the White House from 07 to 08. Uh, so uh, the first war ended, but we didn't achieve our policy goals. Uh, as the ambassador indicated, it got really bad. And then we took another stab at it when it became brutally, violently clear to us uh, with the uh, near civil war in 2006, continuing on into 2007, uh, the loss of both houses that the Republicans held in Congress in the uh, off-year elections in 2006 to the Democrats, uh, a major rebellion among the if you will, the expert and policy community around which any administration operates with the Iraq study group uh, coming up with essentially a, we need to start thinking of getting out of there and major congressional uh, concern and opposition, particularly after the Democrats took over in 2006. So seeing failure in the field and failure at home George Bush changed his strategy from a maximalist uh, policy goals approach, turning to quote Michael Mandelbaum uh, in a book whose subject I forgot, but it's a good book. He basically says trying to turn it into uh, uh, Denmark <clears throat> with inadequate forces. Now, uh, the colonel was here. He can talk, uh, agree or not agree, on whether we had ad adequate forces. But it wasn't just numbers. It was the missions of the forces. And it was how they dealt with the potential Iraqi allies. That it was also the non-military resources we put into this thing. Uh, in Germany, towns the size of, I'm from here, so I guess, towns the size of Lynn 
where my wife's relatives are living now, Bensheim, had an American Gauleiter running it. The one in Bensheim uh, was Sergeant, anybody know? Henry Kissinger. That is, every little town in Germany had somebody who could speak German and had grown up in Germany running it for the U.S. Army, wearing a sergeant's uh, or a captain's rank and being able to call on German tanks if he needed to. Uh, that's how you, if you're going to really transform a country, you do it. We had nothing like this on the civilian side, believe me, and nothing like it down among the people, particularly then on the military side. So Bush was faced with uh, a choice, either continuing on, but there was total opposition to that in Congress and the military and on the ground in Iraq, um, pulling out. And we couldn't do that because we still had this goal of winning the war on terror and showing that America can succeed, including militarily against people shooting at us, or doing something different. So we did something different. We obviously did the surge. Again, are you going to talk about the surge? I can. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth. But the surge, aside from the military aspects, the U.S. military aspects, the surge involved a civilian surge with the best diplomat we could find, Ryan Crocker, and far more engagement in our PRTs and other things, not to transform the society, but to basically humanitarian assistance, early recovery, to get things working again, the water flowing and such, sure. putting the emphasis on that rather than turning the country into a democracy. Finally, uh, we uh, also uh, reached out and used the Iraqis differently, the 100,000 strong uh, sons of Iraq, mainly, particularly initially, Sunnis, who flocked to our side. Well, the dirty little story is they tried to do that a year earlier out in Namba province, and big Washington turned them down. Big army, big Washington. The people in the field, some of us back in Washington, thought it was a great idea. We couldn't do it because we were still with this minimal resources, maximum uh, political goals, and these guys with their kind of quirky, we'll fight for you, but we're not part of you approach, weren't part of our political ambitions. Uh, in 2006. Well, they certainly became part of our ambitions in 2007 because we had ratcheted down our ambitions. That's important. Everybody thinks a surge, you put more troops in, you win. No, you put more troops in and use them differently and find new allies, and now you have a massive military force with a strengthened diplomatic uh, wing but at the same time, you ratchet back your political goals. George Bush basically gave up trying to turn Iraq into a democracy. It was, it's good enough. Let's just beat down the people who are shooting at us. That was primarily the al-Qaeda people and uh, some of the Shia militias, mainly the Mahdi army in uh, Basra and then later in uh, Assad city, uh, Baghdad, uh, so that the country will be relatively at peace. We will have proven our force of arms, that's a good lesson. But meanwhile, we turn the country over to the Iraqis because what did George Bush do? In part because the Iraqis said, we're not going to do this UN deal to extend uh, the privileges and immunities of US troops anymore. You're going to have to negotiate a deal with us. So we negotiated as part of this whole thing a new deal with the Iraqis uh, with a um, uh, long-term mutual assistance uh, agreement, typical that we have with close countries, and a very specific defense agreement that said that we would leave within three years. And we got the parliament to pass it. And the parliament wouldn't have passed that, giving our troops immunities for the next three years to ensure that this peace would stay without an agreement by Bush that we would be out of there by the end of 2011. And in 2011, the Obama administration, I was their man on the ground, we tried to extend it, we didn't succeed, but the point is the war basically ended uh, with military victory in 2008 and with a political uh, solution the United States left with a relationship with Iraq, which is held together, as we heard from Ambassador al-Hakim for the last, what are we now, uh, 12 years. So relative success in a world of only at best mixed successes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Jeffries. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, thank you all. Uh, so I'll try to be brief. And uh, 
So just, uh, of course, of note, uh, none of my remarks uh, reflect any official policies for the Department of Defense, the Joint Staff, OSD, the Army, Cadet Command, or anybody else other than myself. So thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to maybe be a little bit more granular, as I'm not an ambassador uh, at all. Um, so uh, I'd like to take the opportunity. So as a young lieutenant, you know, I joined the Army uh, if, from a military family. Uh, and so my first touch, you know, on the global war on terror was uh, two days prior to 9-11 where I was in the Pentagon with my father in that particular area. And so I spent my last year uh, at school preparing for potential, you know, whatever, whatever might happen. Uh, fast forward as a young armor officer, uh, preparing to deploy to Iraq uh, under the 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, and so we were headed to the safest place in all of Iraq, Baghdad's Sadr City. And so we arrived in March of 2004. There had only been a mild kind of ambush, you know, in, within the past year with the 2nd SCR. Uh, and so um, we practiced uh, diplomacy. We practiced local civil governance. Uh, you know, I attended uh, different meetings, you know, from the local uh, Texas population and, and learned hopefully how to, uh, you know, do the same thing uh, over in Iraq. Uh, and then about six days after we arrived, um, with the closing of the Ahausen newspaper, you know, and some of the other decisions, uh, suddenly we found ourselves embroiled uh, into what became uh, 100 days uh, and then in a, in another set of conflict, uh, both from, from 6 April, essentially 4 April, 6 April, uh, for several months, and then again in August of 2004. Uh, so it was uh, an interesting time uh, for me. Uh, so discussing, uh, you know, some of the, the comments that we had. We had a, an understanding of what we believed classical counterinsurgency uh, theory. And so at the time, we were looking at a clear, hold, build strategy. And so the idea was, of course, you know, we would clear any enemy or anti-Iraqi forces, AIF, uh, we sometimes didn't even know who they were necessarily, um, and so then we would we would hold that territory, okay. Um, although at that point, you know, we were still all ensconced my my maneuver battalion and, and the next maneuver battalion over uh, in a 600 by 800 meter compound outside of Baghdad, Sadr City. For a, an appreciation of that. Uh, we're looking at somewhere most likely between 1.8 and 2.2 million people inside of Sadr City at that point, with uh, one battalion, one infantry battalion of around 700 people associated with that. And we were responsible for assisting civil governance, uh, working with the local you know, population, uh, among other fun things, escorting um, sucker trucks and picking up trash and doing some other things. Uh, following that, with the idea that we would move into the build phase and working with our, our counterparts, uh, whether at uh, State Department or whether um, our civil affairs teams, to promote uh, good governance and then eventually find a legitimate authority to turn over everything to. Uh, and so it was a, a different a, and a difficult situation that we found ourselves thrust into. It was very different from what we had trained for. Uh, midway through, you know, I received tanks. And then for the last half of my deployment, much different uh, combat style deployment than, than we had certainly anticipated at the very beginning. So uh, from that, you know, I took uh, you know, a little road show. I actually ended up in Afghanistan in between. And then in, in 2008, late, two, the late, eight, late December 2008, arrived back uh, as a company commander in Mosul. Uh, so I missed uh, much of the surge. Uh, I was in, you know, at the time what we kind of considered the forgotten war in Afghanistan in 2007. Uh, but in arriving, it was certainly palatable the difference uh, between 2004 and 5, uh, and, and most of the surge had already been accomplished at that point. And so arriving in de December 2008 in Mosul, uh, we believed we were fighting the last vestiges of AQI ISI uh, from. Uh, they had been pushed out of Diyala province and, and pushed north uh, into, into Nineveh province. And so showing up there, uh, so I was responsible, and I, I, get, I guess I get the, uh, the, the push button. I got the opportunity to be the lead company of the lead battalion of the lead brigade of the lead division in Iraq. So I got to be the, the main effort you know, for, uh, for some time, up until the 30th of June 
um, where the security agreement pushed us out of you know the city. Uh, so during that time, uh, you know, I had upwards of nine platoons of Americans, you know, assigned to me, and I worked with six battalion-sized units of Iraqi security forces: the National Police, the Federal Police that they became to be known, the Iraqi Federal Police, uh, two Iraqi Army battalions, uh, and a variety of other um, miscellaneous kind of police forces. And so during that time, uh, it was a, uh, a pretty rough go about it. Uh, my boss, my battalion commander, was killed in a vehicle-borne ID uh, during that time. And so it was, it was a very difficult time. And then so the, to transition from a time where uh, U.S. security forces were certainly in the lead, if not, uh, we, we tried very hard to make sure that there was an Iraqi presence in every patrol that we did, to suddenly transition to outside of the city uh, it, was a, it was a different feeling, okay? It was a, a, a t another tough transition, okay? As I, as, I kind of, uh, as I kind of mentioned that, so as we look to um, where, does this, where does this relate to the war's end, a lot of what I saw as a lieutenant and a young captain, I saw again when I served on the Joint Staff, listen, listening to the end of the war, you know, through civets, through secure VTCs and seeing what, uh, what occurred over there through proxy. Uh, and so, you know, it gave me an opportunity to, to describe to myself and to think about, you know, what my experience was and how does that relate to uh, this here. And so ultimately, you know, we struggled uh, to provide a legitimate authority in order to turn over the security portion of the mission too. Our focus tended a lot towards the national and federal police, which are kind of like a carabinieri, kind of like, a, like an FBI, but if an FBI was more military, um, and, the, uh, and the Iraqi army. At the time, you know, we were, the movement of the Iraqi army from an internally focused force and the federal police from an internally focused force, they were very excited to be an external uh, force as well to defend you know, the sovereign nation of Iraq at that point. Uh, but, it was, a, it was a struggle, if you can imagine, for, for my company aligned against all of those separate forces to conduct security operations as well as train them and then have the additional mission of the actual the local IPs who actually do the, the job that most of us would recognize as a, as a regular police officer, nothing to do with counterterrorism. Uh, and so that ended up being probably the, the least of the missions uh, that we were responsible for. And so, uh, like any bureaucracy, um, you know, if there's a mission that, uh, that doesn't relate to your organization's key uh, mission, you kind of give it to someone and, and put it over to the side. Uh, and so I feel, at least from my perspective, uh, that became uh, what happened with the, the Iraqi police, uh, and then in some cases with the federal police. Uh, lots of, lots of you know, higher level documents, uh, lots, of, lots of thoughts on you know, the Iraqi security forces in general. Um, I think the end of the war starts with what the objectives were at the very beginning of the war. And so I believe there was a mismatch you know, between the ends and means uh, associated with uh, the beginning of the war. And so that certainly led to problems that were then uh, kind of ameliorated, at least you know, through the surge during the time that I was not there. Okay, and then if you can imagine uh, from the perspective, you know, for the operator on the ground, uh, things do sometimes look like they're getting better. In our, in our individual areas, you know, the experience is it's more positive, you know, we're seeing gains, we're seeing stuff, you know, but I never got to see from the national perspective, hey, you know, this, this has got better here, this has got better there. Uh, so it, it's very easy to take a very atomistic view. Uh, my friends and the people that I worked with there in Iraq, um, we're all very honest, very brutally honest. So in, in 2009, uh, it was very, uh, very interesting to talk, um, conversations, you know, and, and at the time, Athil Najafi, you know, the, the mayor, and then the Nineveh province governor, um, and some of the other um, sheikhs, you know, not all that I'll name, uh, but, you know, the, the broad feeling uh, was that the, the Iraqis were not necessarily prepared uh, for us to leave. There was the thoughts that we would continue to get a status of forces agreement and a, and a thought that maybe that at the 11th hour things will be better. 
Uh, and so, of course, that did not materialize. And I think about four months after I left in April, you know, of 2010, 2011, there's the, the, the constant kind of internecine struggles associated with Sunni versus Shia versus Kurd. Um, we saw a lot of those in, in Mosul, as it is the most diverse portion of Iraq. I think much more, much more diverse than, uh, than my tour in Baghdad, where Sadr City was about 99.9% Shia. And so the, the end associated with, uh, with my, my tour there uh, was, was tough, OK? And then you know, I, I think what happened, most likely from my perspective, uh, the Army wrote the book on the Iraq War. They've ended so far in 2006. The, the next series, I think, will hopefully cover some more of this, you know, so not getting too far ahead. Uh, but really, we, decide, we decided that, uh, that we had concluded operations there and transferred to an advise and assist and an occasional counterterrorism role from the clear hold build strategy that we had. And so, and that, uh, this is certainly a different strategy. Uh, as I, as I mentioned just uh, a little bit, we, we talked, it's really hard to disaggregate Iraq from Afghanistan, you know, but the 2008-2009 timeframe, we, the Army sustained 17 brigade combat teams you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan at once. And so the Army was stressed you know, to be able to provide that many combat forces you know, to multiple theaters on the other side of the world and sustain them. And so, at least for the Iraq, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, an access of, you know, at this point of a trillion dollars, you know, that we spent over there on military operations. Um, so, uh, pending anything else, that's my somewhat granular experience, you know, there on the other thoughts, if need be. Thank you so much.